Oh well friends, it's time now to turn to God's Word. Let's turn together once again to the fourth chapter of Philippians. Uh, just to lay out our plans, we'll, we'll be in Philippians 4, looking at verse 8 this morning. Uh, God willing, next Sunday we'll, we'll look at verse 9. Uh, and then we'll focus our minds on, on some distinctly Christmas themes uh, as we move on forward through Advent uh, and then return to the final verses of Philippians 4, God willing, in the new year. But this morning, let's read from uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses that have become familiar to us. Uh, and good verses to be familiar with. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 4 and reading together at verse 2. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. This is God's word that we have read and heard together this morning. I wonder if you've ever been asked that question, what's on your mind? Perhaps it's been a colleague or a friend or or perhaps a family member uh, who has just noticed that you've got something on your mind and they're concerned and they want to know, they, they want to ask because they probably want to know if they can help. What's on your mind? Friends, the reality is that we can all have things on our minds. Sometimes those who are around us pick up the, just the, the hints that there's something troubling us, something bothering us, something that's there in the forefront of our minds or perhaps even in the back of our minds, but it's there. If I were to say to you this morning, what's on your mind? You might say, Christmas. I was speaking to someone on the phone uh, this morning uh, and there I've given away the fact that this message doesn't get prepared on Sunday morning. <laughs> this is Saturday and, and this morning I was speaking to someone on the phone and, and she said, I'm just not looking forward to Christmas. She would expect her, her husband to be in hospital over Christmas. She's got a girl, a daughter who, who lives reasonably close by, certainly in the same county, another who lives further afield. And two or three times just said, I don't know what sort of Christmas it'll be. And, and that is something perhaps on your mind. I'll be honest, I can't tell you how many shopping days there are left, but uh, Christmas isn't too far away. And some of us are are really saying it, it won't be like last year. Well, it won't, because in all honesty, this whole past year has not been like any other year that, that we've gone through. 
And indeed, some of you might say, well, it's it's not really Christmas I've gone in my mind. It is this whole COVID thing. Perhaps you have, have loved ones who, who are unwell or who have tested positive and, and you're concerned for their outcome. And rightly so. But whether it's Christmas or COVID or, or some other care or, or some other concern, when we've got something on our mind, it can really affect our whole spirit, our whole way of, of coping from day to day. Yet, you know, friends, the Bible gives us so much wise counsel. Wise counsel for how to live day by day. And indeed, as, as we've been studying in the book of Philippians, that has been the theme that has been there so much. It, it is how we should live. How we should live in this world. A world that in so many ways is not all that dissimilar from the world of first century Philippi. In terms of the challenges that are faced, the fears that are there. So what does God inspire the Apostle Paul to give to that church in Philippi? Having given the wonderful, wonderful treasure that we find in the book of Philippians, Paul reaches this final point where in verse 8 he says, Finally, brothers. Well, I'm sure if you've been following, you'll know that that's not Paul's first finally. Like most preachers, we can have two or three finalies before we finally close our Bibles and, and the message is over. But, but here Paul gives us his, his final finally. And notice it's finally brothers. It's reminding the Philippian church again that they are brothers, they're in this together. Paul may be in Rome, they may be in Philippi, but together they are brothers and indeed sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the fifth time Paul has used the word brother as a, as a greeting to that fellowship. It's not simply there to remind them of, of, of their friendship, their, their, their camaraderie as it were. But they are brothers and sisters in Christ. And with all that has gone before, everything that, that Paul, everything that Paul has delivered from the Word of God, now he reaches, reaches this point where he wants to begin to wrap things up. He's spoken, of course, as we've, we've noticed, of the, the importance of rejoicing. The importance of our, our very reasonableness in the way that we live and, 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 and interact with others. Our prayers. All of these is an, anxiety, uh, an antidote to our anxiety. And now Paul gives us eight things to fix our minds on. So as we've thought of that idea this morning of what's on our minds... Here are eight God-given focal points for us to focus our minds on. Remember, these are here. All scripture is God-breathed for, 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 our, for our training, for our correcting, sometimes even for our rebuking. But it's for us. And God, through Paul, has given us these points. Notice the first one. Whatever is true. Fix their minds on whatever is true. In the most literal sense of the way Paul is using this word here is, is what is real. What is real? You know, there's a lot in our world today that is not necessarily real. You know, going even as far back as Isaiah's day, 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ came, there were conspiracies in, in chapter 8 of Isaiah. Uh, the, the prophet says to the people, 
you know, God is saying, do not call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. We live in a day of conspiracy theories on so many, many different topics. But we are called to focus on what is true. But again, you may come back and say, with all these different theories, all these different ideas, how do we know what truth is? Friends, God himself is truth. God himself is truth. And when God was revealed to us in human flesh in the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in John chapter 14 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said he was the truth because God himself is truth. He is the one who, we're told in the first chapter of John's Gospel, he came full of grace and truth. And therefore, since God is true, his word must be true. In a world today when people doubt so many things, I want to say to you, dear ones, let us never doubt the truth of the word of God. Or oh, some will say, oh, but there's different translations. Yes, there are. But the manuscript body that these translations are translated from is more consistent than any other historic manuscript. Yes, the scriptures are drawn from a number of manuscripts and each one complements, as it were, the other and works together so that I and other Christian preachers can lift up a good modern translation of the scriptures and say this is the word of God because we believe it is the word of God. Yet there is a contrast and the contrast is between the word of God which is true because God is true and the lies of Satan. As we're told in John chapter 8, he's not only a liar, he's the father of lies. That which is true comes from God. That which is false ultimately has its source in the evil one, the devil. So the God who is true is the God who has given us the truth of his word. And therefore, when we think of the first thing, whatever is true, we must embrace what is true and stand against what is false. But Paul continues and says, whatever is honourable. What does he mean by this? In our world and in the English language, the, the honourable so-and-so, just as a, a title of, of respect conferred on someone in, in usually public life of some sort. But in the way that Paul uses here, and the way the church in Philippi would understand this, it is a way of being that is worthy of respect. Be honourable. To be someone or to be something that is worthy of respect. Philippi was a culture where honour mattered. Remember, it was it was kind of a little Rome. Uh, why do you think Lydia was there as a seller of purple? Well, as I've said before, that was the colour that all the well-dressed Roman citizens were seen in. They were seen in purple. So Lydia was there in Philippi as a, a seller of, of purple cloth. A culture where honour really mattered. But that was the honour of men. Where men would do anything to seek honour. And in the same way to be dishonoured was, was something that was to be feared. Yet what Paul is saying to us here is that we should focus our minds on that which is truly honourable and worthy of respect. And friends, that, as we will see later, is something that is born out of the Holy Spirit's work in a life. 
So who are the men who are honourable? Not the great military generals, many of whom would have retired to live in Philippi. No, it's men like Paul, men like Timothy, men like Epaphroditus, men who had risked their lives for the sake of the gospel. Their examples were honourable examples. And that which is worthy of respect. And Paul says to us, whatever is honourable. But he continues and says, whatever is just. Again, that's a word that pretty much has dropped out of, of our daily use. We, 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 we would use it in a totally different way. But we do speak of justice. But Paul here is not simply speaking of, of justice in a judicial sense, that, that a judge will deliver a, a judgment which may be right or may actually be wrong. But it is just in a, a sense of right, a sense of righteousness. And of course, we've come across this New Testament usage of, of the word just in this way before when we speak of what justification means. It means God declaring to be righteous those whose faith and trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are justified by God's grace through faith in his Son. And therefore this sense of being just not only reflects the fact that God is just and God is right and indeed as the Bible says is righteous altogether but it also calls us to be people who are in the right and do things that are righteous you know it's a Christian character trait to do the right thing And God is ultimately the standard. His word defines what is right. So when we are faced in life with decisions to make, and we would long to be people indeed who will do the right thing. Friends, God is just. We know he will always do the right thing. And therefore we should have our minds focused on what is the right thing. And on doing the right thing. Not what we may simply feel to be right, but what God's word tells us to be right. Fourth thing we're to focus our eyes on. Whatever is pure. As believers, we're called to holiness. And that call means that we must focus on on what is pure. You know, so much of our world, friends, is dirty. Ethically, morally dirty. So much of our media so will go beyond dirty and call it for what it is. So often it's filthy. It's filthy. Paul says, whatever is pure. Whatever is pure. And we, when we live in a culture that seems to celebrate immorality and, and lust, and we find ourselves saying, oh, things were never like this in, in Paul's day. Friends, from everything that we can gather about cities like Corinth and Philippi and Ephesus, the things that go on behind closed doors in our culture today were out in the open in those cities. Paul knew what it meant when God was saying to him, whatever is pure, Paul, whatever is pure, that's what you're to think on. That's what the Philippian church is to think on. That's what every believer is to think on. 
Oh, friends, we're to lift our eyes above that which the world celebrates and think on what is pure. You know, that's going to have impacts. It's going to have impacts on the media that we watch or, or listen to. You know, I, I don't hold this up as some sort of moral standard, but if I ever saw an album, for instance, that I said parental advisory, parental advisory required or something like that, I think to myself, if this is something my kids shouldn't be watching, I shouldn't be watching it either. If a movie was perhaps so violent or so questionable that it had to have an 18 certificate, then again it's a case, if I can't let a teenager watch this when why should I be watching it? And that's not legalism, friends. That is simply seeking to do what God says. Fill our minds with what is pure. And that which his word tells us is pure. But Paul goes on and says, Now whatever is lovely. Whatever is lovely. There it is. Whatever is lovely. You know, the way we use lovely can have different connotations in different ways. I wonder if in a few weeks' time some of you are going to open a present and you'll look at it and you'll say, oh, that's lovely. Are you being totally honest? Are you showing great enthusiasm or are you just saying, oh, well, that's, that's, that's lovely? The loveliness that Paul speaks of here is a quality that is to be delighted in. To be delighted in. I bless God that down through the years I have known people who when I look back upon them I say they were lovely. Nothing to do with their age, nothing to do with their appearance, everything to do with their character. And I hope you've been blessed and privileged to be able, even as I preach these words this morning, to be able to think of people who fit that bill. People who you look back upon and say, you know, they were lovely. They were lovely. It's a quality. A quality that would have us delight in the things that we believe God would have us delight in. To see the loveliness of his creation. To see the loveliness of his work in a life. To see compassion and action. Friends, can I tell you, there is a lot of ugliness in our world. And again, I am not talking here about appearance. I am talking about character. There is a lot of ugliness. Ugliness that seems to triumph in another's misfortune. Ugliness that pokes fun at another's failure. Ugliness on so many levels. God calls us to think upon what is lovely. What is lovely. But number six. Whatever is commendable. What does that mean? It means quite simply, friends, things we can commend. It's interesting that these words that Paul is using here, commendable and excellence and, 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 and other, some of these other words as well, these are words that he aren't generally used anywhere else in the New Testament. But Paul is using these words not only because God's Spirit is inspiring him to, to say this to that church, 
but because these words are relevant to their situation. And I believe we are able to unpack their relevance to our situation as well. Whatever is commendable. Things that we can commend. Things that we can commend to our dearest friend. Friends, our thoughts must never be filled with things that are not commendable. I've known of some preachers, for instance, who have at times preached in such a way that it would be hard to see as commendable. I think of a preacher who I listen to preaching on the, the, the account in, in, in John 8 of the woman caught in adultery. He had also preached on the death of John the Baptist and Salome and her dancing. And he did so in a way that was nothing short of lascivious. There are others I know have done similar things with the Song of Solomon or the Book of Esther. There is no such place for such things in the preaching of God's Word. Or sometimes it's testimonies. Testimonies that are more about the wicked things that someone once did before they came to Christ. Instead of focusing on the difference and the change that God has made in their hearts by his grace. We're to focus on whatever is to be commended. On the good things. The positive things the lovely things, the grace that is ours in Christ and reflects the very character of God. Well, that's six of them. The seventh, if there is any excellence. Again, another word that, that, that doesn't really get used in many other places in the Bible. But, it means to be the best. You know, some of you are probably totally unaware of a film called Men in Black. But there's a bit near the start of the film where uh, some men are being selected for very special operations. Uh, military type operations. Secret service. Uh, and they're asked if they know why, why they're there. Uh, and one jumps to attention, snaps to attention and says, because we are the best of the best of the best, sir. And of course, the, the main character in the movie just bursts out laughing at, at this point. But that's not what's meant here simply by excellence, to excel above the others, to be the best of the best. No, when, when, when the Greeks spoke of excellence, and, and remember, Philippi, for all it's a Roman colony, is very influenced by Greek culture. To, to the Greeks, the idea of excellence was virtue. That which was virtuous. That which would build character. And the excellence that Paul speaks of here is that which will build our Christian character. To seek after that. You know, Paul himself said that, that he would do everything he could to be all that he could be in Christ and that's what we are called to indeed to pursue a mentality that, that means to turn away from simply being satisfied with second best but instead to strive for that excellence that is found in pursuing Christian character in our lives. And eighth, and finally, <laughs> worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. Instead of seeking to gain the world's praise, we're called to seek God's praise. To use all we are and all we have for, for God's glory. You know, 
There are people who spend their lives on the treadmill of simply trying to please others. When ultimately the goal of our life should be to praise God and pursue his praise. What was it that Eric Little said? God made me and he made me fast and when I run I feel his pleasure. Friends, when we work out that which God has given us, whether it is natural abilities and talents or whether it is spiritual gifts that God has given, when we work them out in our life for him, for him he is pleased. And we should know his pleasure. So worthy of praise is not to be doing the things that men will praise us for, but to be doing the things that we know would please God. As Paul said, to pursue that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. To hear the well done, good and faithful servant. Friends, these are eight characteristics that are given to us here that Paul would say, these are what we should have on our minds as we're seeking to live for the glory of God. And friends, the more these are in the minds, then hopefully the less space there is for the things that would trouble and concern us and rob us of our peace. You know, I couldn't help notice as I prepared this message how these characteristics are, are we a complement of the fruit of the Spirit? And as we set our minds and our hearts on these things, as more and more we have these things on our minds, then not only would, would, as it were, they would crowd out the anxious thoughts, but as we seek to see the likeness of Christ formed in us by the outworking of his Spirit, by that bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then surely these are the things that will be on our minds as we are seeking to see God bring this about. Yet, you know, it is not simply the work of the Holy Spirit. Even as we see this fruit born in us, it's not the ultimate goal. The, the ultimate goal is the reality that these virtues, these virtues were most exemplified in the life of the Lord Jesus himself. He himself, was the perfect embodiment of everyone. He was the one, as we noted, who called himself the way, the truth, and the life. Whatever is true, look to Jesus. Who could possibly be more worthy of honour than the one who emptied himself? Philippians chapter 2 was obedient to the point of death on a cross and received the name that is above every name who was more true who was more just than the one who lived a life of perfect obedience and who has given righteousness to his people in exchange for their sin Remember what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. That which is just, that which is righteous. Look to Christ. Purity, what is pure? He himself was the pure and spotless lamb who offered himself as a sin offering for his people so that they too might be pure in him. Is there any more lovely than Christ? Oh, think of Isaiah 53. That beauty was marred. Oh, but there was our sinless saviour, the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, what is there more lovely than him? 
the pure and spotless Lamb, who offered himself as a sin offering for his people, that we might be pure. The Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world, Friends, he is the altogether lovely one. What is commendable, said Paul? No one is more commendable than Jesus Christ. No one. It's the one before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all, Philippians 2. And all the excellencies of God. They dwell in him in bodily form. That's what Colossians 2 would tell us. And those excellence are worthy to be proclaimed and preached to all who would come into contact. And finally praise. As the risen Lamb of God, Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise today, even as in heaven. The host around the throne are praising him. The one, as we read in Revelation 5, who purchased a people for himself from every tribe and language and people and nation has made them a kingdom and priests to our God. Oh, friends, Christ is all these things. If you want these things to be what's on your mind then fix your eyes on Jesus when the road is rough and steep fix your eyes upon Jesus he alone has power to keep fix your eyes upon him Jesus is a faithful friend one on whom you can depend he will keep you to the end fix your eyes upon him oh friends as we think of that praise surrounded throne in heaven we're going to be close our worship this morning by singing there is a higher throne but before we do let's pray our gracious father and our god we thank you indeed that we do not need to have our minds constantly weighed down by the cares and concerns of this world for instead father you have called us in these characteristics that we read in in your word to focus on what is true what is worthy of honor what is just what is pure what is lovely what is commendable what is excellent what is worthy of praise and father christ is the embodiment of all these things so would you fix our eyes upon him as we go into this world lift our eyes father from the world around us lift our eyes that we might look to christ we ask this by your grace and for your glory in his precious name amen now let's sing together there is a higher throne